Good evening and welcome to the December TR Talk session. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. As you may know, our topic for today is rapid impact, getting interventions into hospitals, to patients, and to communities. I want to start by thanking the Translational Research Program, my TO, and the Health Innovation Hub for providing us with this talk. I also want to start by thanking and saying how lucky we are to be joined by such an amazing panel. Moderating for us tonight is Jen Fraser. Jen Fraser is the Director of Innovations at U of T. She is bringing U of T's research innovations to the world. Hello, Jennifer. Hello. <laughs> uh, joining her, we have David Singh. <clears throat> David is the Market Readiness Manager at the Ontario Bio Bioscience Innovation Organizations. Sorry about that. Hello, David. Hi. Good to be here. Uh, we, we also have Sarah Farr joining us. Sarah is an associate at the Genesis Capital. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. And finally, we have Melanie Barwick. Melanie is a psychologist and the health system research scientist at the Hospitals of Sick Children. Hello, Melanie. Hi. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. A quick housekeeping. Um, please keep your cameras off and muted as well. We want to make sure we have an amazing connection while our panelists are speaking. As well, if you have any questions or comments you would like to make during the session, please use the chat option. During the Q&A session, I will be passing on the questions to the moderator and they will be happy to discuss it then. And with that, I'd like to pass the virtual mic to Jennifer. Thank you very much, Jasmine. So I want to welcome our esteemed panelists. Uh, to start off the session this evening, I'm just gonna ask each of them to give a little bit of their background and maybe a few introductory comments about how, what their understanding is of the rapid impact of getting innovations to the hospitals, patients, what their experience has been, just to give everybody uh, in the audience a bit of an understanding of, you know, who is here on the panel, what kinds of questions individuals might be able to, to answer or address. So I'm going to start off with David. Can you start off with an introduction of yourself and, and your experiences? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to uh, Yasmin and Dr. Fehrenbach for having all of us today. So. Uh, as Yasmin mentioned, I'm the Market Readiness Manager at Obio, and I'll give you more of an intro about Obio rather than myself personally, because that'll give you a bit more context about um, why I'm part of this panel today and uh, the specific points I can speak to. So Obio is an innovation organization that supports the growth of the biotech industry here in Ontario. And we do that through advocacy uh, with the government and with the, with the healthcare system. We do that through events that we run, including our upcoming Obio Investment Summit. And we do that through a series of programs that we run in three key areas, access to capital, access to talent, and access to markets. I manage our program into the access to market space, which is called the Early Adopter Health Network. We launched the Early Adopter Health Network at the start of this year, and its goal is to connect innovative health technology companies with healthcare organizations who are willing to evaluate those technologies in a clinical setting to create a determination of value for the technology and ultimately a recommendation for procurement. So our whole goal with the Early Adopter Health Network is to create rapid adoption of health technologies. So um, it was really exciting to see the title of this talk and to be able to participate today. Great, thanks you. Thank you so much, David. Melanie? Hi everyone, um, nice to virtually meet you all. I'm an implementation scientist. So I, um, I sit in the Research Institute at the Hospital for Sick Children, and I'm part of the Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health and the Learning Institute. So I wear a couple of different hats, but primarily I'm a researcher with an interest in how innovations and interventions uh, get put on the ground in a meaningful way and sustainable way. So. Um, uh, doing the science of implementation, which is to say, um, learning about the strategies, processes, um, and evaluation approaches, theories, models, and frameworks, and so on, that um, all come together to inform the best evidence for how to implement the innovations that are developed um, in private sector, but mostly in the public sector and in health but beyond, so not just um, health research. And I, um, I also do quite a lot of professional development in dissemination and implementation science and practice, 
um, on the side through consulting, but also through the Learning Institute at the Hospital for Sick Children. Hey, thank you very much, Melanie. Sarah? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, my name is Sarah Farr. I work as an associate at a, a firm called Genesis Capital. We're a venture capital firm located in Toronto, um, and we invest in life sciences and medical technologies. Um, we really come at the early stages of technology development. We're involved in company building, um, and you know, in order to really support entrepreneurship, we um, were there to put capital towards innovative uh, biotech and med tech companies that have disruptive solutions for the healthcare industry. Um, and obviously being a VC, um, we're driven by, you know, realizing return on investment, but um, we're there to really support that innovation, move it forward and improve um, patient lives. So that's, uh, that's sort of my background, my, my involvement, I guess, at Genesis is really evaluating companies um, with innovative tech and, and uh, selecting opportunities that we can help move forward. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, just a little bit about myself, uh, just in case there's questions out there. So as the Director of Innovations at the University of Toronto, it's my team that actually evaluates technologies that are coming out of the University of Toronto for their applicability in the marketplace, uh, facilitating interactions with, you know, groups like Obio to people like Sarah to see if we can get investment and really get those technologies out there. So as we start this discussion, um, you know, there are I have to say, I, you know, rapid impact for health technologies to me was a bit of a, a misnomer. I'm like, I, nothing in the health sector seems to go rapidly unless there's true need for something like during COVID times, as an example. Uh, so, Melanie, I'm going to ask you this question. You know, you've talked about, you know, you're working on the science of getting innovation introduced into the hospital. Can you give us just some, some basic must haves? You know, who do you even talk to in a hospital to try and get you know, a technology that I think is the latest and greatest thing for the patients and healthcare givers um, to get that validated and tested and actually um, bought by a hospital? Well, thanks for the question, Jennifer. And I could immediately think of a couple of things to mention. Um, you did touch on efficiency in terms of the time it takes for innovations to actually find their way into practice. So I might respond to that question in addition to the what are the core components. So when you when you ask, you know, what do you absolutely need to do in order um, for your innovations to uh, effectively get implemented, I think we're at a point in um, on the evidence-based implementation side to be able to identify some core components that um, that really are the building blocks of things that you must do, must have in your planning in order for things to hit the ground uh, and stay there um, in an effective way. So let me just speak to the efficiency question for a moment, which is, um, you know, how do we how do we do this more rapidly than we have in the past? Um, and um, how do we make sure that there's some sustainability? And I think the efficiency comes from using the evidence base and implementation science. Um, if we use the evidence base in our field to inform how to put other innovations on the ground that are based on their own substantive evidence bases, so it's two evidence groups of evidence coming together, um, then we can really be more efficient because we now follow um, a process that is explicit, intentional, structured, um, and guided by the evidence. So I think we forget when we concentrate so heavily on the science of uh, what's behind our innovation, uh, that there is also a science of how to implement that innovation. And we really need to be mindful of that evidence in that field as, as it exists. 
uh, this field of implementation science has just exploded since to came on the scene in 2006 and we have lots of evidence that is quite difficult and and to synthesize and in any kind of meaningful way um, those of us working in the field are familiar with the evidence but that evidence is really important to two other at least two other groups of people one innovators who work in other content areas uh, who are looking to implement and want to have at the ready some quick guidance on how to do that in an evidence-based way. And funders, whether those be private sector funders or public sector funders who are the purchasers of innovations um, or the funders of innovations need to recognize what it takes. Um, and in my own work, more on the practice side of implementation, where I'm teaching implementation, I've had to come up with some um, at the ready kinds of ways to talk about implementation, what it takes without having people run from the room screaming <laughs> because yeah. it's so <laughs> difficult to, to, to wrap around your, in your head. So I have five core components that I teach. So essentially the five things you must pay attention to in order to implement. The first is who does the implementing? And this is an implementation team, a small group of core people in the implementing organization who are going to be tasked with doing all of the activities in that process. You can think of process like a recipe in cooking, for instance. Um, so an implementation team is the first thing you need to have uh, present and ready and supported by the leadership. Uh, the second is process. So what is the evidence-based process or a series of steps that we know lead to more effective and efficient implementation of innovations? And there's, um, uh, there's information there to be shared. The third core component are all of the factors. Um, and when I speak of factors, I talk about barriers and facilitators, all the stuff that mills around us in our day-to-day -day worlds and the outer setting in our organizations, the factors associated with the innovation itself and with the people who are delivering it that could either facilitate or hinder how that implementation process goes. And the fourth of the core components are the strategies that we use to support implementation. So when we identify barriers, we need to mitigate those with some strategies. And those might be educational strategies or policy strategies or quality assurance strategies. Um, and there's a slew of those to know something about. And lastly, the fifth core component is evaluation. It's the notion of an implementation outcome. And this is really different than a business outcome, for instance, uh, which might be financial or return on investment. It's also different from what we typically measure in health research, which are clinical outcomes or system outcomes. Um, an implementation outcome at tells you whether you implemented your innovation with fidelity, the way it was supposed to be implemented. And as you can imagine, if you go rogue in how you implement and deliver it, you can't expect to have the outcomes that have been demonstrated in the research prior to um, that implementation in its development phase. So those five big buckets are the things that we need to pay attention to at a minimum. Wow, that is amazing information. And actually, I'm gonna jump over to David because it sounds like your organization can help with some of these five steps? Am I got the wrong impression or can you maybe? No, that's, uh, that's absolutely correct. I, it's, it's extremely interesting to me to hear it laid out in such a clear way because <clears throat> interfacing with entrepreneurs and people who, who have these innovative technologies, it's clear to me that they don't always understand the picture laid out that clearly. Um, oftentimes when they are gathering their evidence there's a confusion as to what type of evidence they should be ga gathering it and for whom they should be gathering that evidence. Uh, there's such an importance put on capital because it is the most important thing when the companies are starting off that they can get lost in that and start to only generate evidence that is applicable to uh, VCs, which I'm sure Sarah can talk about. But when they engage with a hospital, there's a chance that they've missed the mark completely because they don't have the evidence necessary to prove their case in a clinical setting and to prove the case of value to the healthcare organization. 
So what we try to do in the Early Adopter Health Network is set them on the path towards understanding what they should be looking for and what they should be trying to generate when they do an evaluation in a clinical setting. And we use um, a term called the quadruple aim of healthcare as our definition of value. And for the audience, I'll, I'll, I'll define that. So the quadruple aim of healthcare is um, population health, patient experience, caregiver well-being, and cost. And so those are the four areas that we ask our companies to focus their evaluations on to develop an evidence set that can then go to the hospitals and go to their implement implementation teams and create a really clear picture for them of why their technology is actually going to be helpful, how it's gonna help patients, how it's gonna help the people implementing the technology, how it's going to reduce costs. And cost is different from price. Um, that's another huge barrier to, to innovative technologies is, is a traditional focus on price. And, and I, think, I think we're all starting to move away from that, um, but, it, but there's still legacies of that in, in procurement and, and those type areas. But, um, cost and uh, caregiver will being patient and, 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 and the, the experience beyond just um, health outcomes, how does a patient experience this technology? Um, because that, that in effect uh, has, has touch points in all the other areas. Okay, so I almost want you to repeat this. So population health, patient experience, caregiver experience, and what was the fourth one? Cost. Huh? Cost. Okay. Cost. Yeah. Cost. Okay. Because, okay, so now we're talking a little bit about all the evidence base that you need in terms of getting procurement at the hospitals to buy into it. Who needs to buy into this first? Is it the clinician and patient com combination? Or is it really that procurement function of a hospital that really needs to buy into it? first? Or is it maybe a combined um, strategy? Can either Melanie or Dave or even Sarah, if any of you have a yeah, um, advice on that? Yeah, I, I, can, I can speak to kind of our approach and, then, and I'd love to hear everyone else's opinion. But our approach is absolutely that you, you're, you need a clinician champion. You need an end user who's excited about your technology who understands why it's a great technology um, and who can champion it both at their organization and more broadly. But frankly, uh, clinicians drive adoption because they're the ones who are gonna be using the technology. And if they don't wanna use it, they won't. If, if a healthcare organization procures something and just hoists it upon a clinician, it's, it's not really gonna work um, in, in our experience. And so that, that clinical champion, champion is super important. From there, you can develop the organizational uh, interest. And um, the patient at the end of the day is going to be excited about anything that, that improves their health uh, and their experience. And, and those are the technologies we focus on anyway. So uh, to me, it's the clinical champion first. Okay. And so I have a different answer. <laughs> sure, go ahead. <laughs> I have, um, and I'm going to try not to be overly academic about it, but um, you know that um, that core component of factors that I talked about. There's probably about 39, or if not more, and some of them, and, and I'm using a different language, but I'm not speaking across purposes from what Dave is talking about because he's really pointing out some of the key elements that need to be in place. Question is which ones are more salient, which ones really rise to the top, doesn't matter where you're implementing, who's implementing, or what you're implementing. And so it speaks to some things in the, in the inner and outer setting that have to do with um, relative advantage, right? So the relative advantage for the patient, the relative advantage for the clinician, for the organization, for the system, right the way up. Um, the tension for change. You can have the best innovation in the world. It can be super cheap to make. You can even have champions and other things in place. But if there's no tension for change in the organization or the system or the unit, you're never going to get there because there's nothing to drive that motivation. And behavior change and practice change is always about two um, key elements of any kind of any inner psychology for anybody. 
it's it's um, what Jonathan Haidt calls the rider and the elephant. This is the rider, so we can figure out, we can totally understand intellectually why something is a good thing to do, but the elephant is our motivation and our desire to go there. And as you can imagine, the rider is a lot smaller than the elephant. So unless that elephant is always, you know, on the path, you're going to have a hard push. So those factors really identify aspects of the process, aspects of the innovation, um, aspects of the individuals who are delivering it. Um, People's readiness to change, and that differs at the individual level and the organizational level. Uh, champions are important, uh, and by, but so are opinion leaders in terms of you know people who are um, outside of the organization or even the leadership within the organization. It's their job not to make it happen, but to remind people where they're going and why they want to get there. Very good point. And that's why I say, you know, events like COVID, which kind of drives that tension for change or this need for new implementation of different modalities can be an environment in which lots of change can happen. Sarah, I want to go to you because as a venture capital firm that potentially would finance, um, you know, a startup to either start deployment or expand deployment of a new medical device or a health IT intervention, you know, what is it that an investor would look for? What minimum um, penetration into a hospital market would you need before you would invest or is it really early on or what sort of things are you looking for? Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually it sort of ties in with um, some of the comments that David and Melanie both made um, especially in terms of, you know, behavioral changes, looking at how ready um, the system and the uh, clinicians are to how ready they are to move um, And I think one of the one of the things that an investor will look at is not just what is sort of the minimum amount of data or validation that will be needed in order to get regulatory approval or um, you know, reimbursement for that matter. It, it's also a large part of our diligence is actually on adoption of new technologies and going out to uh, key opinion leaders in the field, speaking with clinicians, speaking with reimbursement agencies um, and understanding whether there's really um, interest there from the end users of the technology um, because, you know, something may get approved, but if there's no sort of payer base for it, it becomes um, really, you know, not, not of interest um, to us. So actually, our, a large part of our diligence is on looking at that end user um, and understanding whether it's something that there's an actual market for. Um, so, I, I mean, I hope that that gives a bit of, of context just from the investor perspective, which sort of aligns with um, some of the other things uh, the panel has been discussing. Okay, so I have a, quite a few questions actually already in the chat. Um, I'm gonna ask one more on my own and then I'll probably just pull a few of them out of the chat. I noticed Melanie, you've already responded to one of them. Um, my question is, because I, I understand there might be actually quite a few clinicians uh, tuning into this talk. You know, we talked a little bit about clinician scientists being a champion within an organization. Could David or Melanie probably kind of talk to how easy is it for those clinicians to really champion things within their own institution and then get broader adoption? Is it feasible that somebody at UHN could approach UHN and, and deploy it fairly easily within their own hospital? Or are, are there just hospitals in our community that are more receptive to these new technologies? David? Sure. Um, so I, I actually very much agree with uh, Melanie's last point, and I really like the expression uh, that the, the tension for change. Um, the, the Early Adopter Health Network, one thing that was a core principle to our program is that 
two pieces really. One is that it's very much an opt-in program. Um, organizations aren't all a good fit for this type of program because the, the impetus for innovation has to come from the top. Um, it has to be an organizational level commitment to innovation and commitment to the adoption of value producing technologies. Um, so I think it is very much on an institution by institution basis. And then, and then the clinician has the, has the power. If, um, if there's not an institutional uh, view towards change, view towards innovation, then it becomes much, much more challenging. And it is very much, uh, you know, rolling a rock uphill. But the organizations that opt in um, are ones who have kind of committed to that viewpoint around uh, beginning with the end in mind, beginning with the procurement of innovation, innovative technologies in mind. And so therefore the, the framework is there, the, the bones are there for it already. So I, yeah, I do think you need institutional buy-in to allow for clinician um, champions. Great, um, and actually to that point, so I actually live in Richmond Hill and there is a very innovative institution that is maybe it just recently opened or is about to open in Vaughan that talks exactly about that, all the innovations they've integrated into the hospital to ensure that you know, they have the best information passed on patient care and that's shared within the hospital and other interventions I, I understand are being rapidly adopted. Um, Melanie, you're, you're nodding your head is, do you want, do you have a comment as well or? Sure, I mean, I wanna point out that a lot of what we innovate doesn't come through a procurement pathway. These are, um, you know, we, we develop innovations within hospital research institutes and elsewhere that can be implemented for free, as it were, in the sense that you're not buying it from a purveyor. Um, and probably a lot of the innovations and the interventions, which is also an innovation that are developed through research, come down that pathway. Um, I think that um, for hospitals to adopt hospital-wide, organization-wide innovations in practice and care uh, probably has to do with the strength of those innovations, the relative advantage of those innovations, um, the economics of those innovations, I'm sure, come into play, um, but also, um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a moment. I think it also has to do with, um, you know, whether it maps to their strategic plan. You know, um, right now we're looking at innovations in precision medicine at Sick Kids, and uh, not just looking at the discovery of precision medicine sorts of innovations, whether they be digital or otherwise, uh, but also how those innovations will be implemented in the hospital and beyond um, and thinking about that right at the point of developing the proposals for those innovations. So right at the beginning and not thinking about it later. Um, I think those innovations and that pathway can start with clinicians, can start with researchers. I think their the decisions to adopt, as David points out, are at an, you know, a higher level uh, where there's a need and there's relative advantage that can be demonstrated about why you would want to in a, why you would want to adopt that. Um, some things take longer to adopt than others, but as you pointed out, Jennifer, COVID made us rapidly move to alternative strategies for service delivery because we had to. There was no other option um, outside of healthcare. You look at how restaurants have had to adapt in order to. Um, try and eke out a living. Um, and some adaptations in even in the pre-COVID world, if you think about the introduction of um, health information systems like Epic, um, that happened in a day, essentially. You turn the switch off to the old um, system and turned Epic on in the space of 24 hours and people had to sink or swim. Now, the implementation process and training and so on was still ongoing, but context has a lot to do with um, whether you're needing to de-implement something that existed there previously, um, whether they still have options to hang on to that previous, perhaps less than um, 
less than best evidence approach to doing something or whether that old option evaporates. We, we have a hard time letting go of our cherished notions and our ways of doing business and practice. So that depends. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn to our group chat here. Um, so one of the questions from Pat is, Melanie, you talk about evidence. Are you talking about evidence in terms of does it work as promised? Or are you talking about clinical evidence that it makes a difference in outcomes? Or are you talking about evidence in terms of the business case? Probably could be all of those, so. It's all of them actually. So the evidence that you implemented what you thought you were implementing is the implementation outcome. Yeah. The evidence that it actually works is your clinical outcome or even your system level outcome in the sense that, you know, does it reduce wait list or wait time or days in care or what have you. Um, and uh, what was the third one? The evidence that- uh, It's a business case. Like what's the business case evidence? Well, cost in terms of cost of implementing an innovation uh, is an implementation outcome. It's also an economic outcome. So there's really two kinds of costs. What does it cost to deliver this innovation and what does it cost at the front end to implement it? Because there will be, um, there will be other expenditures that happen early on that maybe don't need to occur right the way through in the delivery. Um, okay, so some of the other questions are kind of turning to what are, I think, the best ways that companies can, and sh so um, I'm just going to kind of go back to, you know, one of the factors you talked about, uh, Melanie, was, you know, you have to break down barriers and you need to implementation as well as have facilitators of implementation. And I'm, I'm actually gonna bring up um, an example that I've seen. It's actually a technology that came out of the University of Toronto. It's uh, deployed through a company <clears throat> called MindTech and it's meant for to get uh, additional upper arm or upper body movement for patients that have suffer, suffered, maybe it's Parkinson's or even spinal cord injury, but it's to get additional upper arm movement. And of course, they're using a technology that helps the patient use those muscles more effectively, uh, tracks how well they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And so if I use an example like that, you know, it's not necessarily about the unit itself, it's the support that the company provides to those caregivers that actually encourages the implementation and facilitation within the institution or within the hospital. So one of the questions we got here was, do these technology companies use visualizations to help present how their technologies work when they're trying to get a clinician or a hospital to take on that innovation? Is that enough? Is there other methodologies that have been shown to be more effective? Um, David, you can maybe try that one and. Sure. Um, so it, it really depends on the innovation. So, you know, when we talk about health technologies, we're talking about everything from pharmaceuticals to medical devices to digital health. And in each one of those, the most effective uh, way of garnering support is going to be a little bit different. If you can put something in somebody's hands, that's amazing. Um, if they can have a tactile experience, if they can see and feel and, and, and touch uh, a piece of technology, that's going to have a real impact. Um, obviously, with something like a pharmaceutical, it's not really a thing. So um, you're going to be focused a lot more on your clinical evidence there and your stats behind it and all of that, which is always important. But um, depending on the type of innovation, more or less of an emphasis can be put on other modalities. Uh, with digital health, for example, um, you know, it, it's tough sometimes to describe the value of just another app, right? People in healthcare see these apps being put in front of them constantly and telling one from the other becomes a bigger and bigger struggle. So what do you do, you know? Then it becomes, I think, a lot about um, stories. You know, do you, have, do you have examples? Do you have patient stories? Have you had people whose care experience has been improved by this? If you can put a face on uh, your technology, that's a huge advantage. 
Um, so visualizations, I think, is is a good kind of a good broad way of putting it. But absolutely, it's like um, it's like anything people engage with, right? Like like whether it's food, whether it's art, whether it's a, a piece of technology. The more ways you can engage somebody, the more chance you're going to have uh, to leave them with a positive opinion. I would agree. I would agree with Dave. I think um, the private sector does a much better job of um, marketing, social marketing, promotion. Um, and it's something that uh, academics need to learn how to do a lot better as well. Um, so that notion of trialability, so, you know, putting something in somebody's hands, can you try it out before you commit so that you get a sense of whether this is going to work for you, which is a model we see in the private sector when we buy things, I can always return them. Um, and, um, you know, connecting to other users, people who have lived experience of the condition or have used that product or innovation before lends a certain type of credibility that is oftentimes more important to a consumer than where the thing was developed or who's selling it because it resonates for them when they hear those stories, as Dave was saying, those, um, you know, connect the dots, tell stories, um, give people a perspective of why it's useful and it will resonate for you because that's somebody that you identify with. Um, giving people coaching and support and consultation in the private sector is probably more technical assistance. Um, any kind of assistance in terms of, you know, now that you have the product home or whatever it is, what, what do you do with it? How do you put it together? Uh, and so on. Um, you know, I think the private sector does a much better job of that. And those who are sort of the intermediary private sector, like where David sits and Sarah sit, um, I think we don't do as good a job. We tend to innovate and say, great, fine, we're done. <laughs> On to the next <laughs> project. And, you know, um, I was teaching earlier for TRP. It's my TRP day today. And I was giving them my IKEA example. Um, and everybody has the experience of going to Ikea and, you know, the, the vast amount of time it takes to find your product and bring it home. But when you bring it home, it's in pieces. It's in a flat box. You have to take it out. You have to put the pieces together and you hope and pray that there are instructions and that you can understand those instructions and that all the pieces are there. And then all the nuts and bolts and the Allen key are also there. And also that you're competent enough to be able to put it together, which is not necessarily true for some people. Um, but, you know, if you didn't have the instructions or something was missing, you're up a creek without a paddle. And IKEA really goes to great lengths to ensure that that doesn't happen to their consumers because it makes no, there's no point in having a great product if you can't put it together yourself or use it the way, you know, and, and be satisfied with it. And yet as researchers, we often worry so much about the product and then we put it somewhere, no one can find it. And we don't necessarily include instructions on here's what to do with it now that you have it, here's how to use it, here's how to implement it, here's how to put it together in your organization, which I think is a big downfall. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll add to that as well. Even on the pharmaceutical side, um, it's true that clinical data is obviously gonna be the main thing that um, people will look at, but, um, the idea of manufacturing and scale up, even though those may, may not be, you know, what your patent is protecting, those are really critical aspects of the innovation and ensuring that you have that capacity to manufacture the know-how that goes into that, the scale up capabilities are really huge value adds and you've seen huge, you know, acquisitions um, in the gene therapy space and the cell therapy space. And now, you know, there's so much discussion on um, approaching more of an allogeneic method or a off the shelf sort of approach um, in order to address those concerns. So, um, and then, you know, so that's sort of on the pharma side, on the med tech side, I'll just comment as well on this, on this idea of um, putting IP around features of a device um, that really ensure that the end user has uh, an experience that works for them. So um, if, especially if it's a direct to consumer product, 
ensuring that um, the device is something that um, the end user knows how to operate. Um, and actually one of the companies that we're involved in has been putting resources towards um, engaging with end users and actually figuring out what sort of um, physical features of the device are most, uh, I guess, most valuable to those users. Um, so that level of engagement is also really valuable um, because I think that will um, enable greater implementation, greater uptake at the of, of the device at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, I have actually another question. You've kind of touched on some of the things, but it, I think it really kind of um, speaks to market trends and what can VCs do or what do VCs do to help startups access the market in healthcare? You know, you guys have a much better understanding, I think, of where trends are in healthcare and adoption. Mm -hmm. How, is there a facilitation mechanism or is it just that letting, helping companies understand where, where the market's going? And Yeah, I think, um, I mean, understanding market trends is really important for a VC just in terms of how they're deploying capital. Um, and what investment opportunities they see an impending need, sort of being able to be future looking and understand there have been, you know, assets acquired in this area, but um, you can sort of see pharmaceutical companies coming up on some potential roadblocks or, you know, identifying technologies that will address those impending hurdles, I think. Um, is something that we look at. In terms of actually working with entrepreneurs, um, you know, I, I think um, Genesis has a, a, a pretty long history and a broad network um, of individuals who have expertise in, in things like um, understanding reimbursement and market access. And so I do think that the, a VC can bring some of that expertise to their uh, portfolio companies um, and bring in the key individuals who can sort of help um, overcome some of the remaining questions that exist around, um, for example, what's, what's the best go-to-market strategy? Um, in the case of a device, is it a direct-to-consumer play? or is it following a reimbursement pathway? And there are different organizations um, that have expertise in that area as well that entrepreneurs can get connected with to sort of understand um, for you know, durable medical equipment, what's, what's the likely um, equivalent of the device that they're trying to generate that essentially will cause their, our device to get sort of um, uh, stamped with a certain price tag just based on precedent. So, you know, there are groups that I think um, Venture will have experience with from their past portfolio companies and exits that allow them to sort of bring that intel. Um, the other thing is uh, often VCs will operate within uh, syndicates and also have connections to pharmaceutical companies who will also you know, be able to sort of feed back to us where certain, um, I guess, strategic interests lie and where those pharma companies are moving. And I think having those relationships is really valuable because you get a sense of, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're often looking at um, sort of an M&A play as an exit strategy. And so if you can connect with those large pharmaceutical companies and get some of that, um, some of those discussions going up front, that can be uh, valuable as well. Yeah. Uh, does anybody, David or Melanie, want to add to that or? Yeah, I, I, I think capital also has a huge um, ability to impact um, innovations access to geographic markets. So if you look at the difference between Canada and the US in terms of the size of our healthcare markets, 
Canada, um, the contribution of health technology to Canada's GDP is a, a tenth of what the US is, like by, of course, accounting for population. And yet Canada is known globally for our work in developing innovation, our work at universities, our work at hospitals, the research that we produce is, is world-class. So there's a disconnect there. And what we found that disconnect to be is that because of challenges in adoption um, within Canada due to regulatory framework, due to procurement um, constraints, capital, venture capital often will encourage companies to make their first market the US. And of course the US should always be a target market for innovations. It's a massive, it's the number one market, but why shouldn't Canada be their first market if they're a Canadian innovation? Um, and that's, that's a problem that we're definitely working to, working to tackle, but it's one that frankly is impossible to tackle without some fundamental systemic changes at the government level. Yeah, and that is very, very challenging. In fact, Sarah touched on this idea, like you have to think about who your customer is. Is it really the hospital or is it the patient? And I, I do want to go back to the idea that, you know, this is rapid impact getting inventions, innovations to hospitals, patients, or the community. Why not take these things directly to the people? What, what characteristics make something more appropriate for one method of marketing or, or channel, I guess, <laughs> what channel of distribution versus another. Um, David or Sarah, you wanna comment on that? What distribution channel or what channel and why, why take one route versus another? Yeah, I, I, I can go ahead. Um, so I think again, it's, it's, it's highly, um, highly innovation specific. I think we've seen in the last, you know, five to 10 years, just an explosion of growth in the digital health um, arena uh, in Canada, but also globally. And one of the big reasons for that is because it's so easy to go directly to your, your end end user in digital health. You can put an app on the app store and you can have um, immediately have it put in front of millions of people and allow kind of the natural market forces to, to kind of um, take hold and allow certain things to rise to the top. But that's not always going to be a healthy way to approach health innovation. And um, I think the biggest reason for that is simply one of expertise. Um, of course, a person's individual health care is their own um, ballywick, it's their own domain. But uh, we rely on healthcare professionals for a reason. We rely on people who have the training and the expertise to to know their arena, to know, to know how best to treat their patients. And for a lot of technologies, um, while a patient may advocate for them, it's, it's tough. It's tough to know if it's actually the right clinical decision. And so knowing whether to go top down or bottom up in terms of how to market your innovation, I think really comes down to how, uh, how clinical it is, how complex and how clinical it is and who the person who's going to have the most expertise on it is going to be. Um, yeah, that's my take on it. Okay. Yeah, because there are technologies or interventions that are really quite simple. You know, it could be as simple as a new kind of heating pad for muscle aches or things like that. Um, I've seen TENS machines, which is like a muscle stimulation, you know, again, very direct to consumer. But of course, you know, how effective are they? because they're gonna to have to be made for something that, you know, cause no harm is gonna be their objective, but hopefully it at least psychologically helps the patient improve, but you never really know, right? So. We shouldn't be waiting till the end of the process to figure that out. Yeah. I mean, I think we have implementation scientists as Joe was pointing out to help along the way and bring that evidence base in. We have um, human factors engineers who, you know, Taking a user-centered approach to the development of these things means you're talking to your users and your product promoters right while you're developing the innovations. At least that should be happening. Otherwise, you run into a slew of problems downwind that you could have um, you could have mitigated or avoided altogether. Like we we all know, like the VCR machine that nobody knows how to program, or the microwave that doesn't work because you can't read it you know i mean there are lots of things that we put out there in the consumer space that 
don't pass muster with respect to how usable they are, how satisfied clients are. That's because they miss some key steps in the development process. So how would somebody go about partnering with an implementation scientist uh, such as yourself, Melanie? And, and I guess, is that is that the role of an implementation scientist or maybe expand a little bit on that? Well, again, I think it, yes and no, it depends on um, the, the context for the implementation endeavor, let's put it that way. So, if there's a research component or an opportunity to study uh, how a particular product, whether it's private sector or not, um, gets implemented, then I think that would be an interesting partnership. I think even you know opening opening up uh, a partnership to two different um, ways of looking at the same problem. I'm sure David and Sarah's backgrounds very different from mine. Doesn't make them wrong. Doesn't make me wrong or right either. But you know, innovation often happens when you have that open innovation space, and you can bring people with different perspectives and knowledge and expertise to bear. Um, how do you partner with them? Pick up the phone, write an email, say this is what I'm doing. Um, and um, hope you can get them interested, just like anything else. Okay. So we, so Melanie, actually, you talked a little bit about, you know, you want to get rid of barriers, and I. Part of the reason I brought up this direct to consumers, partly because of what Sarah said, and because of this barrier and this bar barrier through government that actually David talked about. So David, one of the questions that's actually coming up is, you know this procurement issue at the government level, you know, how could we influence that as a community, I guess? Uh, can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I see kind of two major barriers at the government level to uh, health in in innovation really flourishing in, in Canada and in Ontario. One is procurement um, and the other is uh, capital, again, funding, but I'll, I'll start with procurement. So procurement um, in general in Canada, but especially in Ontario, is an extremely risk adverse field. Uh, and there are reasons for that. There are historical reasons that, that have kind of caused that to be the mindset. But it's a mindset that I think needs to change. And I think the way to start that change is by changing the way we think about what the goal of procurement is. Right now, we focus very, very much on cost containment and bottom line price in procurement. If that view can be changed towards value-based procurement, and I, I, you know, back to what I was talking about before about the, the definition of value, then innovation starts to have a chance. Because frankly, if I, as an innovative company, so let's say I've developed a biopolymer that um, can seal wounds and encourage healing of, of wounds. It's, it's, it's you know, a breakthrough in wound care. And then I go to procurement. When that procurement goes public, when that RFP goes out, chances are that procurement will have whittled down my technology to wound care. And at that point, I'm competing with things like bandages and stitches. Yeah. And if I'm competing with bandages and stitches on a bottom line price basis, there's <laughs> no way my innovation is going to make it, right? Some multinational is going to come in and say, oh, you know, their thing might be work a little faster, but a Band-Aid's a Band-Aid, and we can provide you with a million of them for, you know, the cost of what they're charging. And I don't think that that methodology, that viewpoint, that perspective is one that's going to lead to the best endpoint care at the end of the day. Um, so I think a shift in perspective towards value-based healthcare and value-based procurement is a key component uh, to, to changing um, how innovation works in Ontario. And that change can happen at the institutional level, but I think really needs to be encouraged by uh, procurement guidelines, which are set out by uh, the government, the provincial government. Yeah, well, now you get into so value creation and really health economics, um, which some would argue is not really an exact science. Um, you know, <laughs> thoughts? Yeah, well, 
I, I think I'd kick it over to Melanie there and, and, and say that from the sounds of it, uh, it's, it's turning into an exact science more and more every day. Um, so I, I, I'm not a health economist, so <laughs> but I work closely with health economists from time to time, and I would say it is a science um, and uh, has very rigorous and well-established methodologies. I mean, I think it comes down to, and, and this is not my end of the equation, so this is David's world and Sarah's world and not mine on the procurement side of things. Um, people making decisions and setting up administrative bureaucratic systems that don't take the richness of the information into account. And I think David's example is a really good example. Um, you end up comparing apples with oranges um, because that's what the system is structured to, to compare for you. And you don't know that that's what's in your basket, right? And we're getting a question that comes up about the government's new centralized procurement agency. Does anybody know anything about it? Could they comment? Would that be an advantage or not? Sarah, have you heard of this? No. <laughs> no, no. I haven't either, so I have to. Yeah, I, I, can, I can jump in there. So uh, the, the current provincial government has uh, committed to moving procurement to a centralized process. So right now, most procurement for hospitals is done by large procurement groups. Um, these organizations that um, work on behalf of a couple, sometimes dozens of hospitals to procure commodities. The government is moving, uh, Plexus is an example. Uh, the government is moving towards an, a, a system where the government would run procurement for commodities um, for hospitals. And the reason behind it being that it's, the idea is that it's more efficient uh, it's more standardized. You, you have a similar level of care being deployed across all of your hospitals. And um, unfortunately, some of, some of the work there kind of stalled out with the pandemic happening, but uh, I think they're still very much committed to the idea. And I do think it can be very beneficial to innovation, but I think it's something that they maybe haven't quite contemplated yet. Uh, their focus has been very much on commodity procurement um, so far, but I think it's a great idea for them to develop some sort of innovation procurement model that could be centralized and um, could support individual institutions in overcoming that hump that they have with the fact that value-based procurement is more expensive at the outset and pays dividends over time. Um, so I think, I think the, uh, I think, yeah, I think the government definitely has, could have a role to play with that in centralized procurement. I mean, I guess the other big thing with pricing is just, um, and this again goes back to historically how Canada's operated, but um, sort of restricting drug pricing has been, there's a lot of discussion around that, especially in the States right now and how that's gonna impact innovation. So ensuring that Canada offers a market where new drugs, um, where it makes sense to have approval of new drugs and um, where that innovation isn't gonna be stifled by you know, lowest possible drug price. I think it is, is a discussion that's probably worth having. I know it's, it's taking place in the States um, because I think you know, pharma companies are gonna look at whether the Canadian market makes sense. And you know, that's something that, that feeds into it. Yeah, and I concur. Like I, I, we have a group that's government relations at U of T. Um, I heard just through the grapevine, you know, pharma companies wanting to invest in Canada because of our procurement policies. They're not happy about it. So, you know, if I'm going to support, it's going to I'm going to support in a country that's willing to help me innovate by, you know, supporting through buying my drug at market rate. So it all, what goes around comes around, unfortunately. <laughs> Jennifer, I have a question. Sure. For David and Sarah, and you know, if anybody else wants to pipe in. Um, and you know, by virtue of this panel, we have perspectives of the private sector pathway and commercialization and procurement, and also the research pathway of just innovating and putting things out there as evidence-based interventions or innovations for people to use. Um, and it's always been curious to me um, that we have 
entities such as both your organizations and, and Jennifer's at the university that are really in existence to help um, facilitate that process. But the, that seems to be only applicable and available if you have something to sell at the end of the day, if it's going to be a commercialized um, uh, product and something that's marketed that is going to make money for the venture capital capitalists or that is going to be seen as a breakthrough that can be scaled up at such a massive scale. What about people who are innovating, um, implementable, uh, even um, disruptive technologies um, where you're not going to make a whole lot of money. You, there might be a licensing fee if maybe it's innovative software that does something nothing else out there does, let's say. There really is nothing to support, to fund that other than, you know, for someone like me, the federal funding opportunities, um, which are limited in their understanding of why this sort of work is important, to be fair. Um, and there's, there's, you know, short of what support you might have within an organization, no one in sort of your types of organizations that I feel are a good match to help people like me who have innovations that, you know, are, are seeking funding and seeking scale up and scale out. Any comment from the two of you and from Jennifer actually put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good, really good point. Um, because it's true that in venture, you're definitely focused on return on investment. That's what's always going to drive uh, the decision making. Um, and it's true that, you know, in, in academic centers and hospitals, you can have some really, really innovative technologies, devices, diagnostic tests emerging that may not necessarily have a huge sort of commercial market to them, but have value to clinical practice. And I think, you know, um, having institutional funds available within various hospitals is really important for sort of de-risking that. I know um, some institutions have small grants that are directed towards um, getting the proof of concept data and sort of um, starting to roll out some of those devices. If it's in the pediatric setting at SickKids, for example, maybe you could um, use that money to sort of put, I don't know, 10 different devices across the NICU um, to sort of facilitate clinical management. Like, I do think that it's important for institutions to have some of that funding available um, to advance you know, made in-house sort of innovative technologies. And the other thing is on the diagnostic side, laboratory test development, having um, the, I guess these clinical diagnostic labs, um, somehow empowering them to have a, a pool of money directed towards translating um, academic tests into a clinical LDT could be really valuable. Um, on the on the other side, I, I guess um, with venture, you know, we do sometimes see platform technologies that have applicability to markets in less developed regions. And in that case, getting funding from something like the Gates Foundation can be really valuable. Um, where you know the venture group might take on a disease indication that has I guess, greater uh, possibility of return on investment, but um, the Gates Foundation could develop sort of the other side of it for a market that's maybe less attractive commercially. I mean, there are vehicles even within SickKids, as you said, you know, there's there's um, the CEO's special fund and we do have a, an industry partnerships commercialization office to provide support, not funding, but support. and. Um, we have within the Sick Kids Foundation, we have um, an innovators challenge every year and we actually have a project up as a top three this year. But, um, you know, it's, it is harder and I sort of feel like the, the, um, 
you know, the least liked child sometimes because the focus with the university, with the funders and so on is really um, the biotech industry. And if your innovations are not biotech or they don't meet some of the criteria that we've been discussing, um, you kind of don't make, you don't make it on the map. And I mean, I'm a full professor at the University of Toronto. How's the University of Toronto helping me get my innovations on the ground? Um, if the focus is always going to be on biotech and pharmaceutical and, you know, that commercialization pathway. Yeah, so you know, we've talked a little bit about how hospitals need to have that, you know, message from the top, I guess, in terms of bringing on new innovations. I think the same is true for an institution. They've got to have, you know, programs and a mandate for what I think you're talking about, Melanie, which is more social innovation. So things that are going to have an impact on society, but may not have that financial return that a VC group like Sarah is looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say that the University of Toronto is very focused on social innovation. Um, we are wanting to support these types of initiatives and we do have a few programs at the institution that people can apply for those funds uh, for their social innovation. And like Sarah talks about, like. Groups like the Gates Foundation yeah. are really looking for social innovation that can be deployed in third world. You know, you can utilize it here locally as well, but you know, they're gonna actually help you. Gates Foundation actually helps us to find uh, licensees in these third world countries and um, mm -hmm. these types of technologies that kind of supports then its deployment in a first world country. Um, so there, they're out there. They're not as easy to find, <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, the amounts of money are a lot lower. But the biggest thing, honestly, to get those kinds of innovations out there is the champion to really push it forward. And the right connections with the right people who have that more philanthropic um, taps at their heart. So therefore I'm gonna donate some money for this cause. Like that's the type of thing that you can do to support that type of innovation I think you're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, we, t and we talk about, you know, do the hospitals have these foundation funds or funds to go th to these kinds of things? Um, I get the impression at least at the hospitals and you know, if anybody's out there in the community that wants to pipe into this, I'm not the expert. I get the impression that the hospitals are looking for a return on their investment. So the ability to, to get some funding for some of these more from the heart mm -hmm. social innovations um, are, are, are more difficult to get funding for. I, I also think Just keep it on your radar, Jen. I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love to hear more about what, you know, kind of concrete examples because sure. happy to talk to you about one it. One of the things about philanthropic donations is you've got to find that investor that that message and that need hits home for. Mm -hmm. That's where you can get that kind of funding from. And it's that story that you tell and the impact that you want to, you know, have on society, but it requires that you know, cash input that may not, you know, result in some kind of return. Well, it's, it's hard to move philanthropic or any investors, even federal research funding bodies, um, expand their focus from discovery research to how all of these discoveries are actually going to make it into the hands of people who will benefit from them. Yeah. That's sort of like, oh yeah, and then there's that. But it's such a significant problem worldwide and not just in health and not just in Canada. And yet we, we're not, we can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah, yeah. I think it's part of the same discussion around um, 
just a just a general change in perspective. Um, there's so much of a perspective of, of ROI being being the be all end all, but frankly, it should probably only be the be all end all for the companies, the private companies, and for the VCs. Beyond that, it should be looking at uh, the value it can bring, and value doesn't always translate into ROI. Um, yeah. So a change of culture into in for, at the government level and the institutional level into moving government dollars and 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 institutional dollars to support innovations that have not necessarily an ROI but a true value, uh, I think is is very important. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, it kind of comes back to that health economics um, question, and that's why governments sometimes are the ones that ultimately end up providing the funding for those kinds of technologies is because it's got an economic value, but it doesn't have that return on investment that a VC or, or another investor might be looking for. And that speaks to somebody's comment a little ways up in the chat around, um, you know, true clients. And we were chatting about this earlier, but we have such a history in Ontario of, uh, and <laughs> anybody in this space, this is kind of an ad nauseum ter term that you would have heard, but silos, right? Healthcare in Canada is so siloed and it's siloed at the government level, which keeps it separate from the hospitals, which keeps it separate from the uh, end patient. And until we can start to look at value across that entire system as one continuum, instead of each individual stakeholder looking at the value within their own silo, um, that change isn't gonna happen. Although I think it's important to think about evaluation metrics with respect to what aspect of evaluation, what what evaluation means to a different to the different stakeholders. What I want out of something is going to be different than what you want out of it is going to be different than what the hospital wants might be different than what the university wants, right? And I think that speaks to how you structure your process, how you structure your evaluation, how you report your metrics so that all of the partners get what they need out of it. Yeah, so I think it, it, it has to be integrated. So, you know, unsiloed, but still respecting, um, respecting, uh, you know, what's important to each stakeholder. I mean, the other thing we haven't talked about in any of this, and I'm curious what everybody's thoughts are as the notion of equity. I mean, in one respect, I'm talking about equity in access to intellectual support and financial support when I when you come at a um, an innovation from my pathway, say versus a, a commercialization pathway, um, but also equity with respect to when things are developed and launched in a in a um, commercialization pathway, are they accessible to everybody they need to be accessible to? When you say equity, you're thinking about it in the terms of equality, equal access, is that? Equal, equal access, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess there's also, I, I guess, you know, um, there's also the, the inclusion piece, you know, what kinds of innovators are included in a particular program versus not included. Yeah, and I got to say the University of Toronto, um, we've got a huge spotlight on equity, diversity and inclusiveness and creating programs specifically for people that are marginalized in any way, shape or form uh, to try and really promote um, people that may feel that they're marginalized because of, you know, either their sex, their religion, whatever, uh, to really contribute more to innovation and, and not feel like, um, you know, if they're underrepresented, let's, let's, let's recognize that, change that, um, and bring more of those ideas forward um, and put them on a level playing field with everybody else. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize myself in any of my, my, life experiences as being amongst the heavily marginalized and I'm not trying to do that because I think that diminishes from people who truly are. I just think that there's a pocket of innovators that are not on the commercialization pathway that need a, 
that, you know, we're kind of on a dirt road still and we need some either gravel or, or pavement um, to help us get to where we need to get so that our innovations can get into the hands of people to improve their lives. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a really important point. You see it, especially coming out right now with COVID and vaccine, the, you know, the vaccines that have been developed. Um, there's a lot of discussion around intellectual property and IP rights. And if it makes sense for governments to sort of come in and have the ability to grant licenses to other, uh, I guess, groups to sort of, um, I guess, decentralize the manufacturing of those vaccines and enable them to be accessible to more regions. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question. You obviously see it coming out now. Um, and yeah, does it make sense to, even though um, pharma has obviously assumed a large amount of risk in getting these novel vaccines generated, how do we sort of ensure that every country is going to have access to the protection that they need, even if the price tag um, is sort of set by pharma? And I think there's adv advocacy groups now urging um, the World Trade Organization to sort of waive those IP rights. I know Moderna has said that they won't enforce their patents. So, you know, it's a it's a huge discussion right now, I think, on on um, just ensuring equitable access um, to that protection and to care. Um, OK, so I'm actually going to go back to the chat a little bit, um, Sarah, there's a couple of questions here for you talking about, you know, do VCs or maybe your firm or maybe other firms that you know about have any funding set aside for those kind of value initiatives versus a return on investment initiative? Do you know of or? Um, it's a good question. I, I think our firm um, is, is, you know, we operate um, with the intention of uh, return on investment for our investors. Um, the way a VC fund works is, you know, we um, we have our limited partners who have invested in the fund, and at the end of the day, um, to sort of continue raising subsequent funds, it's important for us to show that we have made return on investment and um, that there's a financial reason for them to continue. Um, putting their money into Genesis. Um, in terms of um, these more, I mean, impact, I guess, investing could be could be one way of looking at it. Um, there are some firms that I think are more focused on, on impact investing. And um, I know there's a fund being raised that's looking at preventative care as opposed to um, you know, it, once the disease already exists. And I think that may have a more challenging maybe model, but that's something that they're working through. I don't know a ton about it, but, um, you know, so I do think there is maybe a movement towards that, or at least there's a recognition that um, preventative care has value as well. Um, and hopefully the pricing structure will be there to sort of justify that, those, uh, those investments. Thanks. So Yasmin's asking if I can pass the mic over to Joseph. So Joseph, do you want to jump in here? There's well, quite a bit, quite a chat going on on the side here. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I, I wanted to sort of, I, I, I'm looking at the time and we generally, we, we a lot about two hours, but we sometimes cut a little short because these days, um, with uh, Zoom, it's so tiring, uh, and um, and I know that lots of the students have been in in, in school since one. Um, I wanted to sort of uh, just reflect and to see if you guys had any sort of final words about this issue of rapid, because what I'm hearing is rapid for for commercial 
is different than rapid forum translation of research and science without commercial, which is rapid from different from hospital versus community, which is different than uh, research that's basic versus applied, um, which is different from donors, uh, you know, VCs and whatever else is out there. Um, so how do we at the end of the day have impact on health for patients? quickly. I think it's okay to have more than one road to Rome. Yeah. I think it's, it's fine. I just, you know, there are some advantages to where the money is that maybe isn't always accessible to some, to the detriment of other innovations. Um, you know, um, as a researcher, one never shirks the challenge of trying to figure out how they're going to carve their own path and, you know, um, who's out there who can help and that it's a whole other level of innovation, right? So um, I think the challenge for all the roads have to do with effectiveness and efficiency for whatever road you're on. Yeah, I do agree that I think there's multiple paths here. Um, from the venture side, I would say, my, with my venture hat on, I would say start a company, <laughs> uh, be an entrepreneur and sort of drive that forward and, and think big about your platform and try to raise lots of capital because I think the more capital you have, the faster you can work, the faster you can operate. And big vision, I think, is important for entrepreneurs to have um, in order to create sort of that um, that picture for an investor to come in and and fund uh, at a level that will allow the company to move as quickly as possible. Um, but you know, I, there are obviously opportunities or technologies that are going to impact healthcare that are outside of what a, a venture capital firm will invest in, and. Some of those technologies even might be worth starting a company around, um, but maybe they won't generate VC returns and that's okay too. And within a, within a, a hospital setting, finding the right stakeholders who are going to approve you know, these decisions on new test development or um, implementing novel technologies within your sort of hospital to begin with and then spread it outward from there, you know, that might be a path and working with sort of non-dilutive granting agencies, et cetera. So I think there are a number of different paths that can be pursued. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think, I think the important thing is building the framework for innovation, building the pathways um, that allow innovations to be adopted creating the infrastructure that allows it to be tested and evaluated. Yeah. And those roads are going to be plowed by dollars. They're, they're going to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm laying on heavily on the analogy now, but they're going to be, uh, <laughs> they're going to be plowed by dollars. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that that's the only thing they can be used for. And as we create that culture change and we bring those big ROI companies and have them stay in Canada, we, we, we develop them here we innovate here and we root them here, they become anchor companies and anchor companies attract, attract pools of capital and those pools of capital will be available to um, you know, smaller innovative companies who don't necessarily have the same end ROI, but will have impact uh, in health and on the economy. So I think it's all about um, building that infrastructure from the ground up and uh, letting everybody access it. Yeah, and, it, and it's not just the money to get those smaller, slower growing companies going. It's frankly, it's the passion of the individual to get it off the ground. I agree with Sarah creating a startup. You know, you can be a sole proprietor of your company. You put a lot of sweat equity, a lot of time. Um, but, you know, you're like the corner store owner, with their mom and pop shop. I, you know, I 
started this business so that I could make enough money to support myself and my family. You know, it's not attractive enough for a VC, but it's perfect for me. So sometimes you just are, you're creating and building a business from scratch and you're putting your passion and your, your life into that for a pretty steady return for a family. And, you know, sometimes it's those that really, are the types of companies that build this country and it's a basis for, you know, employing 20 people and that's phenomenal. And we should never lose sight of that. Absolutely. So um, I, speaking on behalf of the uh, Translational Research Program, uh, Medical Innovations Toronto, and the Health Innovation Hub, um, I want to first and foremost thank um, our moderator and panelists um, for a very interesting discussion because I think <laughs> you all presented very unique and very similar in or parallel uh, perspectives in the sense that we need to figure out how to lay the infrastructure to optimize on the research that we, we, we are developing. And I think that is a clear message that all four of you share. Um, I also want to very much thank the Cannot Global Fund for their support. Uh, of this series. Um, and uh, not least, though last, uh, I want to thank Yasmin for all her work in organizing these uh, talks and events, um, which are, are a, a, a lot of work, um, but they have a lot of really interesting discussion and results. So um, I, let's clap and for everybody and thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, our next session is in January. Uh, lots of new things coming up. Uh, new year, hopefully one where we can go outside and maybe <laughs> one day in person. <laughs> maybe. Okay. I want. I also want to thank um, all of the panelists. You guys were great. You had lots of wonderful insights. Um, it makes it easy to moderate, and I just wanted to thank you, every one of you, David, Melanie, and Sarah, for, for joining. Um, Yasmin, thank you for having myself. Um, thank you for joining us, everyone. I really appreciate it. Uh, I actually want to give a quick shout out to the audience. I love seeing the chat blow up and, and you know everyone interacting with each other as well as the panelists. Um, it's just great to have all these mini conversations and really get all different perspectives all in one room and, and sharing ideas. So thank you, everyone. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the week.